tuning into the Inner Revolution podcast. My prayer today is these words will speak to you where you live and create lasting change. Before I get started, we had a great time in Frederick, and what was interesting is we visited a family that was uh, right outside of Frederick in a small town called Middleton, and it was one of those little towns, maybe you've been in them, like they're like Civil War towns. They're a couple hundred years old, and and uh, just walking down the street, you feel like you're walking in history, you know, so much history. So we were visiting this family, incredible, incredible family. Uh, I actually married them about four years ago. Now I think actually five, and uh, they moved out there for business. So uh, anyway, just reconnecting with them was really special. And uh, but I just as we drove into the city, uh, there was this huge church. I mean, this church was probably the largest church I've ever seen. It was this white, massive building. And I thought to myself, at one time in our culture, we built cities or, or towns around churches. You know, and, and what an interesting uh, a series of events to think that we would put such a high value on the church that the, the, that the town would be built around it. Now, I don't know if we do that really much today. Pretty much things are built around business and commerce and such. But, but think about that for a minute. As we were going into this town, I would say that town was at least 200 years old and just seeing rows of homes and just seeing how it was spread out. But this church, for whatever reason, it just struck me that and gave me that impression that just like the cross, we build our life around the cross, don't we? We build our life around that resurrection uh, that resurrection ministry of the cross. And uh, just to say about this family, they're, I think they're going to be a key part of the future work uh, in Frederick, but they just said how much they miss the body. They actually pay attention online, um, and they're connected that way. But, um, but it, we spent an hour and a half with them, and as we were leaving, they followed us to the door, and we got in our cars. They were still at the door waving at us. And I don't, I don't know about you, um, but I haven't had a family do that in a long time. They were so encouraged and uh, so much wanting and hungry for the message. So I want us to think about that in Acts chapter 12, and, and I just invite your, conver- your concentration uh, as well. So Acts chapter 12, uh, just think about that. What are we building our life around? What are we building our life around? And uh, we heard this weekend about comfort. We heard this weekend about idol worship and how we can take our resources and use them for ourself and then for our pleasure. But really, uh, I'm thinking that as a believer in these days, there are uh, many sleeping Christians, many sleeping giants. Now, where do you remember uh, hearing that term? We have woken the sleeping giant. Anybody remember where we've heard that term? Who who in history said that? Uh, that that really was uh, noteworthy. Anybody remember that statement? We have woken a sleeping giant. Anybody? Yes, Japan. Right, the commander in the navy when they dropped um, bombs on, uh, on Pearl Harbor, uh, there was that wave. Uh, and it's amazing that the, they didn't do this, the, the second and third wave that was planned, but they only did one wave and uh, created an incredible amount of damage. Um, I think close to 3,000 died that day, and we lost most of our, our, our Navy. Thankfully, a few were out to sea. But the commander, when he was asked, you know, to do that, that next wave, which would have really been an attack on California, the West Coast, he said this statement. He says, I believe or I think, maybe not verbatim, he said, we have woken a sleeping giant. And if you remember in the 40s, that was December 7th, 1941, but if you remember in the 40s, um, we had just come out of, Okay, let's do a little history here. 20s, the roaring 20s, the devastating 30s, right? The, um, the crash, the dust bowl, the amazing turmoil of the, of the 30s. We were starting to move into um, 
you know, some normalcy. And then the 40s, we started, we were watching the, the rise of fascism in Europe, trying to keep out of the war as much as possible. And, uh, and so America was really asleep at the wheel in one sense, trying to take care of its own, its own stuff. And then, uh, so Pearl Harbor, and to this day, it's still a very large base out there in the, in the Pacific, a Navy base, um, military base. Uh, so it was, it, ro it, it brought all their ships in a row. It was very much, uh, it was not wisely placed in their harbors. All the ships were in a row. So when the, the Japanese Zeros came in, it was an easy target to wipe out many, many ships. And, um, and even they'd worked out, as we know from history, how to drop torpedoes in shallow waters. See, that was the assumption because Pearl Harbor was so shallow, the torpedoes would not have enough time to, to, to arm themselves and ultimately detonate. But the Japanese were very, very, um, very, very smart. And so they had a device on these torpedoes that kept them right at the very top of the water. And they hit the, the famous Arizona and all of these incredible ships and sunk. And, and to this day, it's a tomb for many uh, men and men, women, the sailors there. But my point today, I love to study history. So I, I love to think about, you know, how, as a strategist, how that, how to have that not happen again. <laughs> and, uh, but the commander, again, will never know, will never know. Some say it's because they didn't have enough resources to um, carry on to attack the West Coast. It's unclear why they did not follow through with their full plan. But that statement, we have woken a sleeping giant. We see this here in the Bible in Acts chapter 12. And I, I feel like in America today, the church could be characterized as a sleeping giant. And uh, with what's happening in our day and age, I believe that Christians are starting to wake up. They're starting to... Uh, you know how it is when you're waking up, you're just kind of getting your orientation, you're kind of just laying there, trying to remember where you are, who you are, all these things. I don't know how, how you wake up in the morning, <laughs> but, um, but I think now the church, for the most part, the church, I say that in the sense of the remnant, I mean, I, I'm still amazed at how many churches are still closed and how many people... In in that percentage, it's, some have said it's high as eighty five percent in our in our in our um, in Maryland. Eighty five percent of churches are closed, and ninety two percent of people in that percentage won't return to church. So I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in general, the remnant. And as we e enter the age of the uh, the season before the rapture, I believe we're there. And as the rapture nears. Um, the church will be awoken. Uh, it'll be, and, that, and that's amazing. And I want to talk about that briefly, but to, to uh, wake up a sleeping giant. Now, now if, if we have any sense in us, if we see a sleeping bear, we wouldn't wake him up, correct? If we had any sense, right? Because what happens to a, to a, a bear when you wake him up? It, it says, I was reading about bears that, they are always ready to defend themselves and their keep. But the devil has lulled the church to sleep uh, largely to pleasure, largely to comfort, as we heard this weekend, but also the lack of mission. I think the lack of mission, the lack of being comfortable with what's happened, um, you know, there's not this hunger for more. There's not this hunger for advancement. Uh, but... Look at this in Acts chapter 12. We see um, verse 4, they, they arrested Peter, put him in prison, and they had four guards around him. Peter was kept there in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him in verse 5. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Okay, so, so think about where Peter is totally surrounded, totally, totally chained, and he is sleeping. Now, a lot of times 
this story is based on how he was just faith rest. He was resting in the promise. He was relaxed in the Lord. He was just just totally dependent on the Lord. I'd like to consider this in another light today uh, because maybe <laughs> in so many ways the church has kind of uh, kind of been lulled to sleep. It's kind of comfortable where it's where it's at. They're comfortable in their traditions, but look what happens in verse seven. Behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him, and light shined into the prison. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in prison, but in this particular prison, this doesn't have cable and three square meals. This thing was a really dark place. Okay. And if you go, I've been in these prisons uh, in the Ukraine. They're act, they're subterranean. They're under the ground, so they're they're really a dark hole. So notice this light shined in the prison, okay? And the angel was present near him. Where's Peter? Peter's out like a light. He is he is he is lights on, nobody home. He is asleep. And I love just this simple statement. Okay, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up. So not only did he kick him, but he raised him up at the same time. So Peter was out of it. He was totally out of it. Arise up quickly. Then he yelled at him or informed him strongly, and the chains fell off from his hands. Now, it didn't say that he woke up the other soldiers, but he, he woke up Peter. Now, I can't imagine uh, with the guards at the gate, um, at, the, at the bars, and the guards next to him that someone didn't hear something or see something. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals, so and so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. So Peter was kicked, raised, instructed, and then pushed out. It's an interesting set of adjectives here and actions. Well, I believe uh, in the day and age that we're living in that the church may be in this particular series of actions, okay? Now, Nobody likes change. Nobody likes um, to be instructed outside their comfort zone. But God says, I must lead you out. I must lead you because people are praying for you. Now, think about this. When Peter came to the door, the little girl answers the door. What happens? She can't believe the prayer has been answered. So she closes the door in his face, goes into the prayer meeting and says, Peter's at the door. And they say, you're crazy. Don't you love that? I mean, not picking on the prayer meeting there, but uh, you can kind of get the gist where people really praying with expectation or did they underestimate this little girl? Did they underestimate the messenger? <laughs> and then when they found out the little girl was telling the truth, they worshiped and praised the Lord. So you can kind of see not only was Peter in that place where he needed to be prodded, the church also was in a place where there was no expectation. So, again, not to pick on the church or Peter, but sometimes we need a good swift kick, right? We need a good swift kick. Now, we're not going to illustrate that today. I know you want us to, but <laughs> there's a sleeping giant. So what happened? Let's go back to the Pacific for a minute, 1941, December 7th. What happened to America after Pearl Harbor? It awoke. It, it recognized its potential. It became one of the strongest industrial revolutions and productions in history. In history, imagine that. The, sure uh, the, just the sheer production of tanks, cars, uh, just overall machinery, weaponry. And the nation was alive to its potential. It was alive to its resolve. It was alive to... Um, defending itself and fighting not only one front, Europe, but also the Pacific, right? And uh, that's amazing. If you study that history, and this is why it's such a grieving thing today, uh, uh, thinking about how quickly freedom can be lost, it can be lost by a generation that doesn't understand its value, it can be lost in a generation. It can be lost. And this is why 
we are not necessarily freedom fighters, but we are patriots. But our first commission and citizenship is to God and to, and to heaven and to the Bible. So in preserving this precious book that we hold in our hands, we will not sleep. Because think about how sleep, you ever eat a big meal and the carbs come in? What happens? You start to get drowsy. You start to get kind of like slouched in there. And you start to lose your orientation to what's around. And all of a sudden, you're out. You're out. I don't know about you. I have a seven-year-old. I come home and, uh, you know, from a busy day, and then you spend time together. And it's, like, amazing how uh, you just can shut up. You can just turn off. <laughs> Anybody been there? You ever get so tired you just kind of turn off? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, thanks, Ben. Appreciate a little, little support there. <laughs> it's like we are... And sleep is very important. Sleep is, without sleep, we would go insane, actually. But sleep regenerates, the, rejuvenates the body. But then there's a bad sleep. Then there's that cosmic lullaby that can lull us, and we can lose sight of our purpose, our potential, and our privilege. Well, I want us to think about this um, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, uh, a verse that's often quoted, but... Uh, and again, waking up the giant, I think, what are some things that can wake up the church? Well, persecution wakes up the church. It really does. Just read Ch Acts chapter 2. It mobilized the church. Now, we're certainly not praying for persecution, but God sometimes will reduce us down to a place where he's our only option. He's our only option. Isn't that interesting? Uh and so we're actually, uh, there we are between two prisoners. We could say maybe health could be one prisoner. Maybe finances could be another prisoner. Maybe bad leaders could be one prisoner. Maybe um, uh, consequences of bad decisions could be another prisoner. Whatever it is, you, you fill in the blank. And then we can kind of like, oh, it's always going to be this way. We're just going to take it, and we just kind of swallow it, and we kind of drift away. We kind of lose sight of it. And then the angel of the Lord comes and kicks us. He says, wait a minute. There's another reality. Your prayer matters. Your faith matters. Your faith steps matter. You matter in the kingdom. And he then not only does he kick us, but he lifts us up and instructs us speaks faith into us and says, listen, you're not done here. Your mission's not done. Just because you feel like you're in bondage doesn't mean the game is over. You ever, you know that statement, the game, it, isn't, it isn't over till the fat lady sings, right? I don't know. I don't even know who said that. Maybe that was whatever. I don't even know why I said that. It's not over, right? As long as we're breathing. Anyway, Second Corinthians, I love this. I, I want 10-4. Notice this. We lose backbone. We lose backbone. I was thinking about jellyfish. You ever see a jellyfish? Uh, you know, as you go, I, I love acetique, chickatique, you know, these tons of jellyfish. There's no backbone. They're spineless. And I think, I think the Laodicean Christian can be, become spineless uh, because they no longer live according to the Bible. They no longer... Uh, are connected to the reality of God. That in these days, this is the mo these are important days to stand. These are important days to speak. These are important days to be steadfast. Uh, why? Because uh, you and I, because of the Bible, inspire others. Inspiration and leadership is the motivation of leadership. Inspiration. What inspired the United States to go from um, a sleepy state into full resolve? Well, yes, it was anger for what was done, right? But more than that, there was a recognition of the potential of, of our response. Would we roll over like a wallflower and say, uh, we probably deserve that? You know, we'll just, we don't want to offend anybody. We'll just kind of keep going as, as, as usual. No, 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 no. I, I love Eisenhower. He, he was a, uh, he was a, he had some strong words. And uh, he defined the enemy in that sense where, he, he defined the enemy of freedom. Let's put it that way. 
But as a believer, uh, we have to be awakened, right? Awake thou that sleepest, right? John chapter 9. Because while it's still day, that's when we can work, 9-4. But when the night comes, uh, we will no longer be able to work, which, which he's speaking there prophetically that we are working while we have uh, right before the rapture. Because after the rapture, we know in the tribulation that God will still be working, but we'll be in his presence. But in 2 Corinthians 10 4, what is our weapons of warfare? Well, our weapons of warfare. Okay, my Bible's not cooperating. Okay, for the weapons, okay, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. That's a big verse. How many of us as Christians can war against the flesh? That means we we fight according to our emotions, we fight according to our feelings, we fight according to um, n- cultural norms, cultural acceptances, but we fight according to what is acceptable by culture. The flesh does not know God. We know that in 2 Corinthians 2.14. It doesn't understand the things of God. So God's given us another set of weaponry. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, again, referring to the flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, okay? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, a lot of, lot of content here. By the way, emotion doesn't have power to change things in a long standing uh, evidence, which means we can have a very charismatic, very emotional and powerful uh, expression, but you know what happens? It's like flash in the pan. It it goes away. But you know what changes things long term? It's content. It's content. It's what we heard this weekend. It's Bible, Bible, Bible. This is a this is a way not to fall asleep or be caught unguarded or to be caught uh, unprepared. So when we're reading this, uh, our readiness to revenge all disobedience with obedience. So this is my point today. How is it, okay, you awoke a sleeping giant, okay? You awoke a sleeping giant. A giant, once it's awake, it remembers who it is, what their potential is, and what their purpose is. This is so important with the church. Because someone shared this interesting example with me, two, two interesting examples. A cheetah, everyone knows what a cheetah is, right? A cheetah is an amazing animal. They can run exceptionally fast. But you know what? When they jump, and they, their radius and capability of jumping is very high and long, but there's a limitation. If the cheetah cannot see where it's going to land, it does not jump. Very interesting. If it cannot see where it lands, it will not jump. That's why they can be, they can be, uh, they, there can be a small fence around them. They could easily scale it, but if they can't see where they're going to land, they don't scale it. That's sad, isn't it? But that's that's one of their, that's the way they're made. Same thing with a flea. Somebody was telling me about this. A flea. A flea has an amazing ability to jump, but if it's in a bottle. It only knows the roof of their containment, okay? So if a flea is born in a bottle, they don't even know the capacity they're made to jump comparatively if they're out in the wild or on your dog, for instance. They can jump uh, with great uh, great potential, with with great distance, actually. So when we forget our position, when we forget our potential, we forget those privileges that God's given us, we can become like Peter. We can be chained and in bondage, and we can start to think carnally about the spiritual life, like compliance, right? Compliance. That, that, is, that, is, that word compliance, that's a very interesting word, and I want to be careful how I communicate this, but, but compliance doesn't mean we roll over like a wallflower. Compliance means that We follow what God has said. We are submitted to God, not compliant. 
And I have a lot of emotion behind that word because uh, being in a communist country, we have seen where compliance takes people. And uh, we've, we've seen where uh, people have been led uh, because they have not responded, and, uh, but they've been a sleeping giant. Well, the church is awake. Are we awake? Are you awake today? How many are awake today? I mean, our messages, uh, they, they stir us up, don't they? Why? Because they remind us of who we are, whose we are, and the purpose of our life today. Now, that doesn't mean we become rebels or uh, radicals in the right sense, but we become people that are awake to what's going on. Because imagine, ever fall asleep at the wheel? I mean, that's a scary thing. I have, right? And I've, I've woken up on a guardrail, right? Banging into the guardrail. And what is that? <laughs> usually means you need to take a break, usually. <laughs> um, but more than that, you can, you can literally be lulled to sleep. And, and this is why we have to be awake to the things of God, right? So, uh, so and I was thinking of one other thing. I'm, I know I'm giving a lot of illustrations today, but I was studying the war about Saipan uh, recently. And also, if you look at uh, Normandy, uh, the enemy was so dug into Normandy, and this is one of the reasons why we lost so many men at Normandy. We would have lost so many more if the decoy that was given uh, led a lot of the German soldiers to another spot. But we lost a lot of men nonetheless to Normandy, France, because they were so dug in and entrenched. And I'm just saying as a church, we... Our weapons of warfare are prayer, their Bible, their speaking, standing, and being consistent in what we've been taught, not shrinking back, not making an excuse, not having a theology of apology, but literally digging in with kindness, conviction, and saying, you know what, I'm not going to sell my convictions to the highest bidder here, and I'm not going to slowly wander into the night, but no, no, we're going to take steps of faith, like I love it. Four churches. Think about it. four churches are being being planted in this pandemic period. Four. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. Owings Mills, Glen Burnie, Edgewood, and Frederick. Four churches. Four churches. Now, when most churches are closed, and that's their business, but that's a sleeping giant. That's a sleeping giant. The ability to to, to serve and care and feed the masses. They're asleep. And maybe they should stay asleep for that matter. But the angel of the Lord comes and says, hey, Tom, and he kicks us. Or Ben, I'm going to, Cody, I'm going to kick. And he does it in a way that wakes us up and reminds us, listen, your weapons and your territory, Joshua 1.9, is ready to be taken back. Think of that, Joshua 1.9, every five through nine, every step, every foot that you touch is yours. Imagine approaching Baltimore like that. Imagine pr- approaching Rosedale like that. Imagine pr- approaching your, your area like that. Why? The devil loves it when we sleep, snoring, w- w- mouth wide open, catching flies. No, 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 no. God loves us when we're awake, alert, ready to obey what we have been taught in Philippians 4.9. And I love that. What you've learned, what you've heard, what you've been entrusted to, obey it. Obey it. So we stand, speak, and we are awake. We dig in. Are we running away? No, we're not running away. But Christ fights our battles. Are we, uh, are we using the right weapons? Prayer, Bible, faith, confession, uh, thinking with God, uh, speaking, not not being a wallflower, kind of, kind of like, you know. And this, oftentimes people think the church is weak. Oh, you're supposed to be over there nice and kind, and you're not supposed to. You just, you, just, you just settle down over there, you know. No, but the church is wise. The believer is wise, right? Harmless as a dove in the sense of innocence, not harmless. It doesn't mean we sit on our hands like a fatalist. We're innocent before God. We're pure is what the word really means, and we're wise. God says, I give you wisdom on how to advance and move forward. So anyway, just to stir our hearts today, maybe some things don't touch us like they used to, and God says, I want to peel back a couple layers. I want to bring in the fear of the Lord again 
so that you're awake to righteousness. Isn't that good? Psalm 17, 15, awake to righteousness. Pursue godliness, 1 Timothy 6, 6. And as we're awake, we can, what, what happens? We see, we hear, and we know, and God gives us the increase. Amen? So, Father, bless these thoughts today. Lord, help us. Give us that good swift kick, we pray, and uh, arouse us again. Rouse us up. Stir us up. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Thanks, friends, for joining us for another episode of the Inner Revolution podcast. Please find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode.